Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Uh, we are pleased to have in our audience today uh, World Affairs Council members here in Philadelphia, uh, some folks who've traveled with the World Affairs Council on our educational tours uh, who are all over the country, um, some members of other World Affairs Councils from around the, the nation, um, and some of our high school and college students who participate in the Council's education programs. Um, I want to th uh, thank uh, all of you uh, on uh, the line who have used our uh, pay what you wish option uh, for the program. Um, obviously, we, we need uh, an ongoing stream of revenues to be able to continue to give you this kind of content, and we appreciate your support. Um, if there are technical issues that uh, come up for you as audience members during the program, uh, please use the question bar uh, and the Council's uh, Vice President for Programs, Haley Boyle. Uh, we'll be able to help you behind the scenes. Um, later in the hour, we're going to take uh, some questions uh, from you in the audience. Um, and uh, we've altered, uh, for those of you who've been with some of our other webinars, we've altered that process a little bit today. Uh, so to ask a question uh, of one of our speakers. Hello, Brian. Excellent. We had a little technical difficulties with Brian, but they are now resolved, I see. Um, to ask a question of one of our speakers as we go forward, uh, we're gonna ask you to type it into the questions bar. Uh, if uh, your question's uh, selected, um, I will either read it out loud uh, if you don't have microphone access, uh, or I'll announce your name, uh, and then you'll receive a prompt to unmute your microphone uh, so that you can ask the question uh, for everyone to hear uh, before being muted again. Um, and once again, Haley, Haley Boyle uh, will be able to assist you in that question process as we go forward. Uh, so with that, we will go on to uh, our discussion today. Um, this afternoon, we want to cover, uh, as you saw in our announcement of this event, two related topics. Uh, the pandemic in Russia and how the coronavirus is affecting and will affect uh, the Putin regime at home. Uh, and secondly, uh, the state of relations between the United States and Russia in the face both of these world-altering events and also in the face of the upcoming American uh, presidential election. As you know, our two distinguished and expert guests are Brian Whitmore, a senior fellow and director of the Russia program at the Center for European Policy Analysis, and William Burke White, Richard Perry professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm going to ask Brian to lead us off with some opening remarks about the pandemic uh, in Russia and its domestic political effects. Uh, then we're going to go to uh, to Bill for an overview of uh, his thoughts on the, the world affairs question in all of this. Uh, and then following those opening remarks, the three of us will have a bit of a conversation before we turn to questions uh, from you. Um, so with that, Brian, take it away. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Craig, and thank you to the, to the Philadelphia World Affairs Council. It's great to be here. As somebody who lived in Philly, studied at St. Joe's, and went to Villanova, it's, it's great to be virtually back in uh, in Philly. Um, we had some interesting news today that I think is actually relevant. But President Vladimir Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, tested positive uh, for coronavirus, and he is the second person in Putin's Kremlin administration and the fifth senior government official test positive for COVID-19, including, of course, the Prime Minister, Mikhail Mishustin. So um, that that was, I think, the, the, the virus has literally invaded the Kremlin. And I think this is true also metaphorically as well, um, in a lot of ways. The, the COVID crisis, I think, is under undercutting many of the pillars of Putinism and the Putin regime. This does not mean the regime is about to fall, but the, but what it does mean, I think, is that the Russia we see that emerges out of this is going to be very, very different from the Russia we see going into it. Um, Russia now has the third most infections in the world behind the United States and Spain. Um, at the latest count, they have over 232 confirmed infections and 2, 000, over 2,000 deaths. But there's reason to believe that that is even deflated. Um, information came out last week from the Moscow city government looking at deaths in the month of April 2020, and it showed that it, they were 1,700 more than the five-year average for the month of April 
from 2014 to 2020, so for the last five years, suggesting that the coronavirus deaths in Moscow are actually much higher than the 642 that's been reported, possibly three times as high. Um, and this is reminiscent of the early stages of the pandemic when Russia was reporting a very low uh, number of reported infections. And it turned out that they also, at the same time, had an inordinate, unusually high number of pneumonia cases, which later turned out to be to be COVID cases. Um, now that said, I want to kind of just briefly talk about the ways that this is chipping away at the pillars of the Putin regime. Uh, most importantly, I think the COVID nineteen is, is accelerating what I call the desanctification of Putin's rule. Right. I mean, Russia is hardly the only country in the world struggling with a response to COVID-19. God knows we know we, we, we know this here in the U.S., but the political consequences of an inadequate response are much higher for a highly centralized and deeply personalized regime. The pandemic is effectively piercing the regime's aura of invincibility and omnipotence. Um, the cancellation of Putin's April 22nd referendum, for example, was, was, is, a, is a victim of this. The Victory Day Parade, which was supposed to be a big legitimization ritual for the Putin regime, was, it was, was a metaphor for this. And it's no accident that Putin's numbers have fallen to historic lows. The latest Levada Center poll last week showed it at 59%, which is the lowest of Putin's entire presidency. You have to go back to 1999 when Yeltsin named him prime minister and heir apparent to see Putin's numbers as low as 59%. Now, in the West, in the United States, 59% looks great for a U.S. president. In an authoritarian regime, 59% is not good. Um, at all. You have to have figure, if you want to rule like Putin, you have to have numbers up in the 60s or the 70s. Another trend I've been tracking is that COVID-19 is accelerating centrifugal forces within the Russian Federation. Um, Putin's been largely invisible as, as COVID-19 cases spiked. His appearance this past weekend was his first time he was seen in public in a month. And in his absence, regional leaders are stepping into the void and kind of taking the lead in this. Um, and this is kind of, it's, it's adding to centrifugal forces within the Russian Federation, it's adding to regionalism, it's undermining the kind of mystique of Putin's rule, and it's also adding to something else, this, this anti-Muscovite sentiment that is never far below the surface in Russia. Anybody that's lived in Russia knows the, the antipathy, antipathy that is felt towards Muscovites uh, throughout the entire country. Now, the first outbreak, of course, was in Moscow, and there's a perception that this is a Moscow problem and that Muscovites are spreading it. So you have different regions that are not allowing Muscovites to rent apartments, or if Muscovites try to access their country homes in another region, they're being forced into quarantine. And this is being added to because Sergei Sabyanin, the mayor of Moscow, has been placed in charge of the national response, which is creating more tension between Moscow, the city, and regional leaders. So we have these kind of centrifugal forces that have always been just below the surface, have always been latent in Russia, and they're becoming much more manifest right now. The final thing I'll say is, and the obvious thing, is what this is doing to oil prices, which are undercutting a key component of, of, of Russia's state budget. Um, which is partially a self-inflicted wound uh, to a degree, but we can get into that more in the Q&A. But I, I guess I'll, I'll stop there um, in the interest of keeping this moving. Thank you. Bill? So first, Craig, thanks for, for having me. It's always great to be back with the, the council. Um, and I really agree with everything Brian has said about what's happening internally in Russia. Um, I think the top line is that this really does undercut uh, the aura of invincibility around Putin. Whatever the crisis was, uh, he found a way to respond to it uh, over the last 20 years. Um, and it's 20 years uh, to the week, in fact, that he uh, came into to power. Uh, but I think as Russians look at Putin, he isn't offering solutions. Uh, he seems bored, distracted. Um, and notably, as Brian said, 
this is the first time really in that 20 year reign that there has been space for other political actors to emerge in the Russian political landscape. That uh, before, if they emerged, it was because Putin wanted Medvedev to be on the stage in a certain way. Um, and like Trump, Putin has allowed the governors um, to really decide what the local response will be. And as we're seeing here, uh, the names of local governors uh, are now household names, both in the United States and in Russia. Uh, what does that mean, though, for U.S.-Russia relations? And I want to look at this from both the Russian side and from the U.S. side. The first thing I would say is that Putin has a clever tactic when things are going poorly at home, which is called uh, create global turmoil of one sort or another. Maybe that means you invade Georgia, or maybe it means you invade Ukraine, or maybe it means you interfere with an election or go to war in Syria. Um, and so what you might expect Putin to do in a moment where he appears fragile uh, domestically is to shift the focus to international affairs, which is where uh, sort of his you know, strengths lie, where he is perceived as uh, really being the person who put Russia back on the global map. The problem for Putin is there aren't a lot of cards to play in that world at the moment. Um, the U.S. election is still six months off. Uh, there are no neighbors to invade right now. Uh, and you're not sure if invading a neighbor might actually expose your army to a COVID outbreak. Um, so his typical uh, approach to this sort of a moment uh, isn't available to him. And that leaves him, uh, I think, without uh, a lot of options. Uh, the country has, still has plenty of money despite the oil price issues. One of the challenges, uh, obviously, for Putin is figuring out how to restore uh, oil prices and a deal with Saudi. Um, but there's still plenty of money sitting in, in reserves. So uh, he's not in a moment of desperation, but I think he is in a moment where the system he built for 20 years is collapsing around him and his usual, collapsing may be too strong a word, but showing signs of fraying around him uh, and his usual game plan in that moment can't work. Um, now, some have suggested this could be a moment for a, uh, a rapprochement between the US and Russia. Um, Donald Trump talked to Putin last week and I guess bragged a little bit about the dismissal of the Flynn case. Um, might that mean a moment uh, of, of, of rapprochement, uh, something Putin could brag about on his side? Um, and I think the answer is probably not. There are some structural factors that make uh, meaningful rapprochement between the U.S. and Russia uh, quite unlikely now and even unlikely after uh, the 2020 election in the U.S. Um, the first of those is, of course, on the U.S. side, um, that Russia has become so politicized uh, between the Mueller investigation and Trump's contacts and uh, electoral interference that Trump doesn't have a lot of maneuvering room on Russia in the U.S. political space. Um, and so, too, Putin doesn't have, I think, a lot of maneuvering room uh, in terms of shifting the U.S.-Russia relationship. There are four or five major issues that continue to define that relationship outside of COVID. Um, first, of course, is the New START Treaty, the Strategic Arms uh, uh, Reduction Treaty that will expire in February of next year. Uh, and the US and Russia have to figure out a way to move forward on that or the last arms control agreement that's really still in place between the US and Russia will expire. And the Trump administration has made very clear that they are not going to proceed on a new start unless China is involved as well. Um, and I don't see that changing, particularly given the challenging US-China political dynamic at the moment. Um, so if you can't make headway on start, maybe you could make headway on oil prices. Both the US and Russia have a strong interest in increasing the price of oil. Right now, um, it means that U.S. shale is basically not viable and Russia would prefer higher oil prices. Um, they tried it and it didn't really work. There was an agreement that Trump and, and Putin brokered around the price of oil two weeks ago and oil prices um, have not really uh, rebounded. Um, the third issue that could define the relationship is 2020 election interference. Um, but you can't do much on that right now because Trump doesn't want to admit that it happened in 2016. Uh, and so there's not a lot of room for, for conversation or mutual commitment uh, around that. Uh, the fourth issue uh, I would call um, Putin's foreign uh, uh, engagements, Ukraine, Syria, and Venezuela. 
Um, and in each of those, Putin has been either, uh, you know, trying to disrupt things in Ukraine, uh, trying to assert power in Syria, or, or trying to keep Maduro in power in Venezuela. The problem is on each of those, the U.S. and Russia are fundamentally opposed. Uh, Trump has been very forward-leaning on getting Maduro out of power in Venezuela. Putin, very forward-leaning in keeping Maduro in power, just to use one example. So I don't see a lot of room there. The final item might be a reduction in sanctions. Uh, sanctions are hurting Russia. They are hurting more probably during COVID uh, than they were before it. Um, but Trump doesn't have a lot of political room to lift sanctions without the Democrats going after him on it, understandably, given uh, his close relationship with Putin. So I don't see that issue giving way very much. So I fear that we are sort of stuck in, uh, in this limbo in the relationship, um, at least through the 2020 election. Um, that's gonna pose a couple of moments to see how things play out. Does Russia interfere as they did in 2016? And is that interference consequential? It may not matter, but what will matter is, is Russia actively interfering? Second, um, if Trump wins, uh, does he perceive himself then as having more freedom to re-engage Russia? Uh, or if Biden wins, Biden is, um, you know, lived through the Russia reset under Obama and Medvedev that didn't work very well. And I think even Biden will be a little loath to make uh, a rapprochement or a new reset with Russia uh, a, a key moment uh, of his early foreign policy. So I think the relationship is going to be stuck about where it is um, and that neither Putin nor Trump's response to COVID is opening up new opportunities uh, for them to respond other than perhaps sending some medical gear back and forth or some ventilators. Uh, the Russians uh, sent us some that now seem to have a fire hazard problem, given what we're seeing in Russian hospitals. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to be uh, a way to reset the relationship either. Thank you both. Wonderful overview on both of the issues uh, that, that we want to cover. Um, I want to stay with um, uh, the, the COVID situation just for a bit, and, and then we'll branch out. Um, Putin has maintained, it seems, um, uh, a pretty a pretty tight control on information about the epidemic coming out to the outside world until very recently Brian most of the statistics that that you gave um, you know as a, as a scholar and expert on this um, you have access to these but I think people uh, sort of casually reading mainstream American uh, media would would have noticed uh, Russia kind of um, you know noticeably absent from from reporting uh, about the epidemic around the world until very recently so I guess I have sort of you know, two parts to this one is um, has there been a strategy as, as you see it to to uh, to minimize um, reporting on uh, the uh, uh, the epidemic in Russia by the world media uh, and or or was the American and European media just so focused on domestic issues that, that it was sort of ignored um, and then the other part of it is one story that, that did get out that has gotten out is, is these reports about doctors in Moscow falling out of windows uh, quote unquote um, and I wanted to hear uh, uh, both of your, your your views on on what is the real story behind that uh, Brian, let me start with you again. Sure. Um, no, in, in terms of, um, it, it was very curious that Russia was noticeably absent from the countries that were being mentioned early on in the, in the we heard about Italy, you know, we, 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 we heard about Iran, of course, we heard about China, um, we heard about South Korea, but in, in, as cases were, were rising in countries throughout the world, Russia looked, it just looked like this wasn't a problem in Russia, and just, just didn't add up. I mean, Russia shares a huge border with China. Where the, where the initial outbreak was. So it just didn't make any sense. And it turned out they were effectively, of course, underreporting. Um, and they were reporting a, a spike in pneumonia cases. It became almost a joke among on Russian social media about the, the about we have this, while the rest of the world has COVID-19, we have a pneumonia epidemic breaking out. It was Russian doctors, effectively, Russian medics that exposed this and said, this is a ridiculously high spike in pneumonia. This is not pneumonia. And this was pushed out by, and, and, and there, there's enough access to information that sooner or later, this got out. The same thing is happening with the death totals right now. Same exact thing. But the, at the end of the day, the, the, the regime's ability to control information is, is, is not total. I mean, the access to the figures I cited at the very beginning of, 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 of our discussion, I pulled from the Russian media. 
I pulled those from the Russian media right before we went on, just to make just to make sure I had the most the most recent figures that were available. So, um, and they 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 square with what I'm seeing in, in Johns Hopkins and others and others that are tracking this um, globally. Um, another thing I would add along those lines is that the the Russia passed a law uh, prohibiting what it called fake news about the coronavirus epidemic. Um, what is the what is fake news is is obviously in the eye of the beholder. And that the initial people that were hassled over disseminating fake news were those that were exposing the regime's lies on this. But nevertheless, despite this intimidation, despite this lawfare, the truth got out. And Russians basically know what's going on. And it's like 41% approve of the Russian government's handling of, of the pandemic right now. About these, these doctors that are that are jumping, falling, or perhaps being pushed out windows and we just don't know quite frankly we just don't know what is what is there i would not rule anything out i'd be interested in hear, hearing williams uh, uh, opinions on that um because it's again it's it's anybody that follows russia for a living for a long time you 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 are trained to expect the worst and to never rule out the darkest of dark scenarios um some of these doctors have been complaining vocally about the lack of ppe um, but yet again, also we, we we know that outbreaks among the pandemic, like everywhere, are among healthcare workers are 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 are, are awful. So I, I don't rule out suicides here. Um, it's an awful story. Um, I certainly like to get to the bottom of it or see some enterprising Russian investigative journalists get to the bottom of it. I'm not ruling anything out. Bill. So what we do know is that the virus has caught up to Russia, and it may have been a little late getting there, um, but that the numbers the Russian government has been giving out are wrong. Um, some of that may be uh, simply bad testing, not enough testing, the same problems we have here. There's a recent study that shows the excess mortality in Moscow in the month of April uh, of 1,700 more deaths than usual, and excess mortality may be a good way um, to get at that. Uh, I also think that Putin's strategy early on was minimize, 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 and hope for the best. Um, sounds a little familiar to some other president's strategies uh, early on. Um, but that strategy now is uh, giving way to the reality of the fact that uh, Russia, I actually think today, it kicked from third to second place with the number of deaths, the latest data I saw. Um, and the hospital systems are overwhelmed. Remember what the hospitals looked like in New York City back in April? Um, and I think it's entirely possible that some doctors uh, committed suicide in the midst of that. I think it's also entirely possible that some doctors who wanted to or were threatening to report information or talk to journalists mysteriously got some help falling out of a window in Russia. And that is entirely consistent with how the regime behaves. Um, what's shocking most to me is yesterday, Vladimir Putin goes on national television uh, in the midst of, you know, really Moscow is where New York was in April um, and announces a, a reopening of the country this week. Um, and so Putin, sort of like Trump, is trying to say, let's move past this. Let's leave it to local officials to take the blame when it goes wrong um, and to shift the narrative on to whatever the next thing they can find to talk about is. Let's uh, let's pick up the thread that uh, both of you mentioned about oil prices. Um, so I, well, I've seen it reported that uh, uh, Putin sort of engaged in a in, in a gambit um, uh, with the Saudis uh, to try to control uh, prices and production, uh, and that he lost. That the Saudis really sort of came out on on, on top uh, in in that exchange. Um, I, I want to ask you if you think that's correct, and and also. Um, if it is correct, then it, it may well be the biggest sort of geopolitical reversal that, that Putin has had in ever since he, he became sort of more aggressive on the world stage 10 years ago. Um, Brian, uh, let me start with you. Yeah, I mean, my, my understanding of that, and this is based on talking to my contacts in Russia and reading the, the, the Russian press and social media, is that this was effectively Igor Sechin's baby. Um, Igor Sechin, of course, is a close Putin associate, going back to their time in St. Petersburg together, a GRU veteran, and the CEO of Rosneft, the Russian state uh, oil monopoly. Um, and my understanding was that Sechin just badly, badly miscalculated. 
He thought he could play a long game. He understood that in the short run, uh, lower prices were going to hurt the Russians. But he also just has this hatred for the United States, and particularly the United States shale industry. And he saw an opportunity to effectively just sink the U.S. shale industry, bankrupt it. And he miscalculated badly. It hurt the shale industry, but it hurt Russia a lot more. It was a classic case of cutting off your nose to spite your face. Um, we were just talking about this this morning at SEPA, about whether there is going to be a reckoning. I mean, uh, Sechin is a very close associate of Putin. He's been, he's gotten away with, with murder quite literally, actually, in, in some would say. Um, and there's there, there's there's a lot of people wondering whether he is going to suffer in Russia's vicious court politics as a result of this, because there is a widespread recognition that this was basically Sechin's doing. There's been attempt, attempts to whitewash this. There was a highly critical um, op-ed that was going to be published in Vietnamese, which was spiked at the last minute, but then the, the author simply just published it on his Facebook page. And it got probably more attention than it would have gotten had it been published in Vietnamese. So there's been an effort to kind of, kind of whitewash this, but I see this as something Sechin convinced Putin to go along with. Now, again, I'm reading the tea leaves. I don't know. I'm not inside either of their heads, but that's my understanding of what went down there. Just a bad miscalculation by Sechin, effectively cutting off his nose to spite his face due to his hatred of the U.S. shale industry. Yeah, and a bad miscalculation that uh, didn't take into account that global demand for oil would go to zero at the same moment or right after that. Russia um, had the reserves, certainly, to uh, weather a period of low oil prices, pushing U.S. shale out, hurting the Saudis. Um, but no one expected that oil prices would drop into the negative range uh, in the month following um, that, that effort. And certainly, uh, you know, it was a miscalculation, maybe even in ordinary times, uh, it was a catastrophic miscalculation uh, when world energy prices then uh, plummeted uh, literally in, into the negative zone. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see whether uh, Russia and how Russia recovers from that. All of the major oil producers are desperate to push the prices of energy back up. Um, to do that means uh, limiting supply. Uh, and even when uh, the COVID moment ends, if there is an end to this moment uh, that, that we're living through, there is now a glut of oil um, sitting in tankers around the world. So the supply uh, will massively outstrip demand for a considerable period of time, making it harder uh, for Russia to pull those prices back up. Like if I may just jump in on that, I mean, we had a very interesting webinar this morning about the effect of uh, energy prices on Russian foreign policy behavior. And if we are indeed in a period of prolonged low energy prices, which is what it appears to be, historically, this has caused Russia into periods of foreign policy retrenchment. Um, now, the jury is still out as to whether and the model we're all using, of course, is the 80s and 90s which the context in which perestroika and glasnost happened and then the kind of new 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 soviet foreign policy which was less 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 aggressive a lot of people in the russians believe there was a us saudi conspiracy to drive down prices in order to 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 harm the soviet union whether history is going to repeat itself is open to anybody's guess because russia has unlike then over 500 billion in in, in foreign currency reserves and unlike them, they have really mastered the art of the kind of low cost bargain basement foreign policy where they use these these low cost uh, measures like troll farms, disinformation, mercenary groups like Wagner and, and, and other things that, that, that effectively allow them to achieve their foreign policy goals on the cheap. Now, whether whether or not they're going to be able to do this or whether we're going to see a period of retrenchment is, is a good question going forward. So let's stay with that and this, this sort of notion of the of a Putin doctrine uh, and whether it, it survives the current moment. Um, I, I guess I want to ask each of you whether or not you think, um, with the hindsight uh, to the extent it's available now, uh, whether or not uh, Putin made uh, the right bet with respect to intervention in Syria. Uh, it, 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 when you weigh the benefits. Uh, and the costs uh, to, to Russia in Syria, both direct costs and, and sort of uh, political opportunity costs in the world, um, was the intervention, has the intervention been a success? Uh, Bill, why don't we start with you? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess it really depends on what your framing is of success or failure for Putin. If I were Putin today, looking at the domestic situation in Russia uh, in the moment of COVID, uh, you might be wishing you'd made a few more domestic investments. And if Putin has uh, failed, uh, you know, he's failed in many ways, but one of the great ways he has failed, I think, um, is failure to really invest in uh, adequate domestic spending, domestic uh, economic revitalization, uh, the healthcare system, among other things, in Russia. Um, and a, a base in Syria and an ability to uh, sort of control some outcomes in the Middle East may seem more valuable to Putin in ordinary terms uh, than it does right now, where some of, of that aura of invincibility domestically um, is fraying around him. Uh, and you might well see a Putin coming out of this somewhat humbled and saying, actually, uh, if I want to stay in power till 2034, I better do a little more domestically. Uh, and, you know, the bailout package that Russia offered was tiny compared to, to many countries. So I think that trade-off may be there. In the world of, um, you know, his impact in, in global affairs, I do think the Syria investment that he made um, gives him perch in the Middle East in a way that he has long wanted. It expands um, his sphere of influence um, back to areas that it always was during uh, the Cold War and, and the Soviet era. And I think for Putin, that was how he was framing success. Could you restore the borders of the Soviet Union to some degree, see uh, the intervention in, in Ukraine and, and the seizure of Crimea? And could you restore Russia's global ability to interfere? Um, and Syria gave him that uh, for relatively low cost of investment. Uh, whether that's something that he still will be judged on or still desire after COVID um, is an entirely different question. And I think the investment may look uh, like a wasted opportunity to do more at home uh, when, uh, when all the cards are on the table at the end of this. Yeah, I would I would agree with 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 everything Bill said. I mean, if you're measuring success by the the, the measure of keeping Assad in power, which he said that certainly was successful. We thought Assad was finished uh, in, in the beginning of 2015, and he and he clearly is not. Uh, Russia was able to preserve a client, um, a client state in the Middle East. Um, so by that measure, is it success? By other measures. I think there are geopolitical costs to Russia for this. And one of them is Turkey. Um, Russia was very, very successfully kind of courting Turkey as almost a Trojan horse within the Western camp. Um, there was a natural affinity between Putin and Erdogan. And then now they're on opposite sides in Syria. Turkey is, is seeing that it is, you know, the, the possibility of a, a hot conflict with Russia looms at any time since they were supporting opposite sides in the Syrian civil war. And Turkey understands its own history and it understands that all the major wars it fought with Russia by itself, it lost. The ones it won were when it had allies in the West, the Crimean War and of course the Cold War. So I've heard uh, Turkish experts make this, this claim that this is ironically, this could push Turkey, which was naturally drifting out of the Western camp, both in terms of values and quite frankly, in terms of, 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 of commitment to the alliance, um, it might push it back to understand where its true friends are, um, because it understands Turkey can't stand alone against Russia and it needs its allies. So I think that, and, and if, if you were to ask me, if I were sitting in the Kremlin and say, which one of these things would I rather have? Would I rather pluck NATO is number two military after after the United States or 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 have an enclave in Syria. I think that's a no brainer. So from that perspective, it's a it's a net geopolitical loss. I would argue. Uh, all right, let's stay with the uh, global geopolitics here. Um, the pandemic has clearly uh, exacerbated and, and accelerated tensions between the United States and China. Um, I have seen some observers argue that the Russians will be all in on the side of China. Uh, in any such dispute, uh, anything short of military hostilities anyway, um, uh, because uh, that's the best way to, to help bring the United States down, so to speak. Uh, but I have seen other observers say that Putin will try to triangulate, uh, and uh, what he really wants is a multipolar world, uh, a world of anarchy, um, not dominated by either the United States or China, and therefore he wouldn't want to help China uh, achieve a kind of a kind of dominance. Uh, who's right? 
Um, well, I, I'll, I'll jump in first and, and say, I, uh, given that dichotomy, uh, I go for the triangulation mode. Um, I think Putin's goal is not to bring down the United States, but to put Russia uh, front and center in all the major global geopolitical cont contests and challenges that are out there. And a world where both the United States and China are a little humbled actually looks better to Putin than a world where China is beating down on the United States. Um, that leaves more room for Russia, which is inherently weaker um, than either China or the US. Um, Russia, of course, also shares a very long border uh, with China. Uh, and it's a fascinating ride across the Trans-Siberian just to see how big that border is. Um, but it means that Russia is extremely vulnerable to China uh, and needs China. So Russia will clearly try to maintain good relations with China, um, not want to pick a fight directly with China. But I also think we'll triangulate in ways that try to keep a group of, uh, you know, big powers uh, at the table. I actually think the ultimate um, direction that we're headed, however, is not a world where China has reasserted or asserted itself uh, and the U.S. is beaten down, um, but where all major powers uh, emerge from COVID weaker um, than they went into it. Um, and that uh, China is going to face a lot of blowback for what it did. The United States is clearly shown its hand as unable to lead uh, a global response. Um, and Russia right now is probably looking a little irrelevant. And if anything, that may be what is driving Putin. Um, this, you know, he does not like Russia to be irrelevant. And on, you know, as COVID has responded, Russia looks more and more irrelevant to global geopolitics than it has uh, in any of the past crises. I mean, Craig, I would add a third category to the two, to the two you added. Um, all in with China, triangulate. I would say let's make a deal is the third one. And this is what Russia always wants to do with the West, is, hey, look, we know you're worried about China. Just give us our way in the former Soviet space. Give us our sphere of influence. Give us Ukraine and Georgia, and we'll join you against China, right? I think that, and you'll see a lot of like wishful thinking in the Russian official media about that, that perhaps that is what they would like. Now, I don't think that's happened. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, we're talking about giving away something that's not ours to give, the sovereignty of, of Ukraine, the sovereignty of Georgia and, and others. Barring that, I mean, I think Russia would like to triangulate. I think Russia would certainly like to triangulate. But when you have uh, an economy that's smaller than New York City's, how are you going to triangulate with the number one and number two economies in the world? Right? So I think Russia's ability to triangulate effectively I think they would love to. And even though they punch above their weight, you're still, again, talking about an economy that's smaller than the combined market cap of Google, Microsoft, and, and, and Apple. Right? Um, so I think what we're stuck with is Russia all in with China. I think that's where it's going to be. And Russia is going to be, I mean, if you ask me where I think this is going, is Russia will be China's junior partner, become disillusioned with that, and, and at some point run to the West and be a junior partner there, and then continue playing this game. An interesting thing that I uh, came across and wrote about last week, actually, was uh, something on social media, Valeri Solove, who's a former press professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, MGMO, who is known to have really good contacts in the elite, wrote a social media post saying, our Chinese uh, comrades have asked our assistance in pushing back against any attempts to investigate China's handling of, of COVID-19 in the early days of the outbreak. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. And I started doing searches in both the Russian language media and Russia's international media outlets to see if there was any kind of attempt to push back against it. And surprise, surprise, there, there, there certainly was. Um, in the Russian domestic media, you had this playing up this scary prospect of a cold war between the United States and China and a global confrontation. And gee, isn't it so too bad that the Americans are pushing into this and we're going to have to come to the defense of our Chinese comrades. You know, there, there's a lot of that in the Russian domestic press. In the international press, it's this effort to isolate and, and set aside the United States, like as if the United States is the only one doing this and that the kind of, let's put it charitably, the more conspiratorial um, uh, accusations of China's behavior in the early stages of the pandemic are being played up like the only thing that's being talked about. 
when in fact there are very legitimate concerns about transparency and secrecy, and they're not just coming from the United States, they're coming from Australia, they're coming from Germany, but if you read Sputnik and RT, it's only the United States that's doing this, and this is just because the, you know, the, the big bad American imperialists want to want to pick on China. So there, you see an effort to separate America from its allies. Um, so you there, so you do already see this kind of coordination between Russia and China in their messaging. Another area you see it is in sanctions. Russia has been pushing a a, a campaign to use COVID-19 to get sanctions lifted. The, the, the idea is that they are inhumane, they are stopping countries like Iran from, from dealing with the, with, 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 with the pandemic, they're harming Russia's ability to deal with the pandemic, and they're trying to push this humanitarian argument uh, that China's assisting in to get sanctions, to get, to get sanctions lifted. So it's, again, it's been unsuccessful. We're beginning to see like convergence in the messaging between China and Russia. And that tells me a little bit about where this, this is probably going in the near term. All right, I wanna do one more and then we'll uh, take some questions from, from our audience. Um, and I wanna sort of uh, bring it home, right? So as everyone uh, listening uh, on this program knows, uh, there's a, a consensus of the US intelligence uh, community reflected in the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee report. Uh, that in 2016, the Russians intervened in our election with the goal of helping candidate Trump become President Trump. Um, so I want to ask you from uh, each of what uh, you know and follow, if you believe uh, efforts are continuing uh, as we speak by the Russians uh, to support the re-election uh, of President Trump um, in November, um, or uh, as, uh, as, as I've seen uh, sort of a, what may be sort of a newer narrative uh, building in some quarters, there was a, a big piece about this in the Atlantic yesterday, uh, arguing that um, Putin cares perhaps less about who wins um, in uh, November than he does about simply uh, having Americans doubt the system. Uh, and that really the attack is, is not so much about promoting one candidate against another, but really about trying to, to make the, uh, uh, the, the track so muddy uh, that no matter which horse wins, uh, nobody believes it was a fair race. Um, I, I, I'll start with you, Brian, on this. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. And I think the Russians are interested in anything that is um, supporting, to, that is hollowing out the political center. I guess that's the way I would put it. Anything that hollows out the political center is good. They were supporting the least mainstream candidate among the Republicans, that would be Trump. Um, they would not have been happy with a Marco Rubio as president or a Jeb Bush. And they were also, and this is not to say that people were willingly accepting it, but they were certainly puffing up Bernie Sanders uh, candidacy in, in the Democratic primary against Secretary Clinton. And they were doing it, again. there is evidence that they were doing it again um, in, in, in this primary and trying to kind of play up tensions among the Democrats. Now, that said, they, they, they certainly would like to have the most disruptive candidate win at the end. So I don't think these two theses, which are often presented as mutually exclusive, I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. Um, I think they were as surprised as anybody with the results of the 2016 election. Um, from, my, from what I heard from sources, there was slight panic in the Kremlin when it actually happened. It's like the dog that actually caught the, you know, caught the car, <laughs> if, if you will. Now, again, I don't know this. Um, uh, again, we, we rely on, on certain um, you know, signals intelligence that we get and, and, and um, the, the very, very limited sourcing we have there. But, but I heard there was panic in the Kremlin um, at first. Until they, they until they recovered, um, so but I I, I think I, mean, I think you're referring to Franklin Foyer's excellent article in in the Atlantic, and I don't I don't think that is is I don't think that is mutually exclusive, and I, I expect this to continue um, in 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 2020, um, and I think they're going to have a a and I agree with, with with Franklin, I think there's a big opportunity because with all of our attention on COVID-19 right now there's not a lot of bandwidth to do election security. And that was a heavy political lift. It shouldn't have been a heavy political lift, but it became such a partisan issue that it was in fact a heavy political lift before COVID-19. 
And now in this area where we're, where, you know, we're going to have limited bandwidth here in Washington to get anything done. Um, I, I worry that we're not going to be we're not going to be as ready as we need to, and that the Russians are going to take advantage of that. Um, but again, this is nothing new. There was a white paper that came out of the Kremlin back in 2012 that, that saying this is something we need to do. We need to exploit these wedge issues in the in in, in the West, hollow out the political center, empower the extremes. Um, so this they 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 didn't really this didn't really come as a surprise, and they've been doing it in other countries before they were doing it in the United States. Um, which shocked us in 2016, they had the nerve to do it to us. They've been doing it to a lot of other, the Ukrainians can tell you about this, you know, going back decades, um, as can the Georgians, um, as can the Baltic states. So I, I, I would be very surprised if we didn't see this this time, and I, I really hope we're much more ready for it this time. Yeah, you know, I think back to 2016, and I say, what was Putin really trying to do then? He was investing a relatively small amount of money to test an idea. Could you use technology, you know, all of the, the trolls and everything else to disrupt a political system? And I think he was probably more surprised than most that it actually worked. Not worked in terms of being outcome determinative. I don't care if it was outcome determinative. It worked in that it disrupted the system. Uh, probably, uh, and I agree with Brian here, he'd rather Trump or Sanders. He wants people who are disruptive. He is a disruptor himself. And what he proved in 2016 is that he has the capacity to do this and we have no defenses against it. Um, and that gave Russia a strategic advantage. Um, like with any other weapon system, uh, when you don't have a defense and the weapon system works, it creates a vulnerability. And Putin now gets to exist in a world where everybody knows he has the capacity. Um, and we have failed in the last four years to build a defense system to it. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time in the 80s building a Star Wars defense system and everything else. Uh, we have let three years go by with no defense system built. Uh, and he still has the capacity. Um, and we know he's going to use it. He used it uh, in the primaries. And I think he'll use it in, in the general election as well. But it turns out that that small investment was more valuable than all of the nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union could build, because it did have that effect in one election of getting us to question what was going on, whether our electoral democracy worked. The Iowa caucuses seem years ago at the moment, but remember back in February when the results coming out of Iowa were delayed for several hours? Every single one of us said, wait a minute, did the Russians hack the election? And the Iowa you know, Democratic Party had to come out and say, no, 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 we haven't been hacked. We're just incompetent in adding up the votes. Uh, and the fact that an election result now has to have an asterisk after it to explain whether or not it was hacked means Putin got what he wanted. And he still has that capacity today. Thank you. All right, I've got a couple of questions from the audience uh, where audience members have, have, uh, have asked uh, me to, uh, to read them. Um, so the, the, the first question goes to um, where are the trustworthy sources uh, that people in this audience and elsewhere can look to to learn case numbers, death numbers, and other facts about the epidemic in Russia? What, what, where are the believable sources? Brian, you want to give us your views? Yeah, um, there. Despite um, uh, perceptions to the contrary, there, there, there still are credible media sources in Russia. I consult Medusa every day. Now, that's based in Riga, of course. It's former journalist from Ria Novosti, which was taken over by Putin's media empire. The best journalist left in form of this media outlet called, called Medusa. It's published in both Russian and English. Um, so the lang language uh, language skills are not going to be a barrier there. Um, so that that's a that's a great source. Novaya Gazeta, um, which is a is a is one of the most venerable Russian opposition uh, newspaper. Uh, again, that's in that's in the Russian language, but that's that that's something I consult regularly. And then there's there's some um, sources that are not necessarily oppositiony, but I just think they try to do a good job of analyzing this and they understand which lines they have to color in to not get in trouble with the regime. Uh, Republic.ru is also a great a great news site that I that I look to. But then now it's a lot of social media accounts of Russians that I trust and follow. Um, Andrei Soldatov, right? The the well-known journalist and author of, of, of Red Wave. 
Um, and he has a great new book out now about the about the Russian diasporas and how they've been used by the Kremlin. I, 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 fo I follow Andre very closely, uh, Valeri Silovey, who I cited earlier in this discussion today, a former professor at Moscow State Institute of International Relations. So I would, so there are sources out there. I don't know, Bill, if you wanted to, to add, add to some. I'd add Jania Albots is another name of one yes. of these people who Jeanette. I sort of look to her posts on. Um, had a very influential uh, radio program, um, Echo Must Be. Uh, the other thing I would just say to people is um, two things, triangulate and know the bias of the source. Uh, you know, if, if three different sources are giving it to you and they're independent sources, I mean, independent of one another, I trust that more. Um, and I'll read something coming from the government, knowing what its bias is, and I'll read something coming from the opposition, knowing what its bias is. And that's harder than just saying, oh, there's one source, but it's a little like watching the press here. If I see it on CNN, it means something different than if I see it on Fox News. And we have to be good consumers of information that understand the positions of, uh, of media because media in, in all countries is different than it once was. Yeah, I would add to that. I mean, I read it's Vestia every day. Mm -hmm. But you know where it's coming from. Slavishly pro, you know, slavishly pro Kremlin uh, news outlet that is um, like, it's, uh, it's, I guess it's Putin's Fox News in print, um, but I want to know what the Kremlin's messaging is every day. So I pay attention to what's in his vest because it's giving me an idea of what the messaging is. I also look at the mass circulation tabloids like MK and to see what they are, what's being pumped out to the masses in terms of opinions and, and how, how the news is being slanted. So I think it's just as important to get a sense of the regime's thinking. I don't read those things to get facts that I trust that are unvarnished and objective. I read them to get perspective on, on how the Kremlin is, is, is approaching the news on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. So, so I'm actually going to ask you uh, uh, both uh, uh, when you when you have to say yes, I knew you would anyway. Um, but uh, when when uh, when we're done here, perhaps in the next day or two, uh, you could both uh, uh, send send us an email that that has. Uh, what you think are those best sources, particularly the, those uh, individual uh, social media accounts, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll circulate it to, to this audience. Uh, I know folks are, are interested in getting the, the, sure. the best quality information. Um, second question that we have uh, from, from an audience member uh, reads, um, might there be an option for the United States to get closer to Russia to counter China? sort of the inverse of what we talked about before. And then it goes on, and if so, what will be the consequences for countries like Georgia and Ukraine, which have had to deal with Russian aggression? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the sort of big geopolitical thinking. You know, we are closer to a world today of a multipolar great power world. I mean, look back at uh, the Congress of Vienna if you want to sort of think about what that means. But it means that you've got um, several big powers playing one another uh, off uh, one another. And um, the U.S. foreign policy for most of the last 50 years has been built around uh, having a set of values that were committed to human rights, democracy, uh, and a tension sometimes between those values um, and our interests. And we saw during the Cold War um, that play out certainly where our interest in containing the Soviet Union meant we violated our values in lots of places around the world. Um, and I think the United States will be faced with that question fundamentally. Is our commitment to Ukraine as an independent state and a, and a democracy? Is our commitment uh, to human rights in areas where Russia has able to uh, exert its influence uh, more important to us than great power rivalry with Russia, China, and others. Um, under the Trump presidency, um, those values don't seem to be particularly high on his foreign policy agenda. Uh, and I think if Trump looks out at the world and says America first, he'll look at those interest questions. Um, I think if Biden wins, we may see a resurgence of uh, those values uh, in driving U.S. foreign policy. But the short answer is what happens in that world um, of, of to, to places like Ukraine and Georgia and others, uh, is the U.S. will have a choice of do we sell those out and say they don't really matter, those values of democracy there and our commitment to those countries, um, because we want some gain from the U.S.-Russia relationship? Uh, or do we say uh, we're not willing to sell those values uh, in exchange for maybe a deal on oil prices? No, I would, I would concur with all of that as somebody who firmly believes our foreign policy needs to be rooted in values. Um, any deal we cut with Russia for whatever we may or may not get vis-a-vis -vis China 
and you could substitute in any other uh, foe there. They, they've made this argument about terrorism in the past, for example. We need to team up with Russia and give them what they want so they can be our partners against terrorism or China. What we're basically being asked to do is give, give away something that isn't ours to give. We don't own Ukraine sovereignty. Ukraine owns Ukraine sovereignty. We don't own Georgia's sovereignty. Georgia owns Georgia's sovereignty. So I, I am very skeptical about the possibility of a deal, regardless of who the president is, because I think there's enough people in the foreign policy establishment and in the Congress that would just balk at that. Um, so I, I, I maybe maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. I would certainly use whatever limited influence I have in our nation's capital to, 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 to lobby as hard as possible against that, um, because I just think it's, it's wrong and it's also not in our interests. And the um, Russian relationship is one of the few places Congress has been willing to push back on this president. Yeah, um, yeah, and no, so sure. I do no. think voices on both the, both sides of, of uh, the, the party lines in, in Congress would push back if there was a, a real cozying up to Russia uh, at the expense of uh, our support for, for values in some of those other states. And certainly Ukraine's sovereignty. I mean, and also along the normative piece, I mean, I the way I view the Russian-American conflict or the conflict between Russia and the West right now, I see it as a normative conflict. I see it as a systemic conflict. I see the, a Russian system that is based on kleptocracy and authoritarian arbitrary rule. And this kleptocratic system needs to expand these kind of net patron client networks beyond Russia's borders, which means that any democracy on tra that, uh, that's transparent and follows the rule of law on Russia's borders is a threat to this system. The Russians refer to it as sistema, this system based on patronage and, and, and patron client relationships and the subordination of the law to power. It is a system that has its own internal logic and it, it, it seeks to expand into other markets to create what a brilliant report from Chatham House a couple of years back very politely called a Eurasian business space. I call it a kleptocratic space. Um, but we are in our, our democratic system that's based on the rule of law and institutions and accountability, or at least it's supposed to be, is in a natural conflict with this. It's a normative conflict, not unlike the Cold War. Um, in that we are look, we have two normative systems facing off against each other, and therefore, I mean, I'm kind of seen as a Russia hawk. But the reason for this is that I I just see it as I find it very difficult to find common ground with a system that is based on patronage and kleptocracy. I just don't I don't see how you you find common ground with that. So I I I, I see it as as a systemic conflict that is going to get be very difficult to get over, regardless of what we may get. And I don't think we're going to get anything out of it anyway. Not certainly not something that's worth sacrificing Ukraine's sovereignty. Brian, we lost you for a second, but all right. So we've hit we've hit five o'clock. Uh, we did start a couple minutes early. Uh, a couple minutes late, rather. So we'll go late just for one one last question uh, from the audience, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, last question. Will COVID-19 hurt the Russian economy more than it hurts the U.S. economy? Uh, they don't have much of their economy coming from entertainment and leisure. Um, so how do you think this uh, this sort of stacks up as we go as we go forward? Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, go. So I think, first of all, none of us still know how badly COVID-19 is going to ultimately hit the U.S. economy or any other economy. We're in a, in a world of unknowns and potential second waves and so forth. What I worry is that this will hurt the small business economy in Russia in a devastating way. Uh, the oligarchs, the big energy companies, they have lots of resources to bear this through, and they're fundamentally in cahoots with the Russian state. Um, they're going to make it through. Norilsk Nickel is not going to you know, disappear and go bankrupt. Um, but actually, a small part of the Russian economy, but an important one for political reasons, does involve things like entertainment and restaurants and uh, the small business sector. Um, Putin's bailout package did very little for most of that small business sector. Um, and that's where 
democracy might be kindling. It's where you get people who can become part of the middle class uh, rather than just the oligarchs and the poor. Um, and my worry is COVID-19 guts that segment of the economy, the non-state workers um, and the non-giant uh, enterprises um, in a way that makes democracy in Russia even more fragile uh, and undermines the sort of sp the places where you could have uh, an emerging middle class uh, and an emerging voice uh, for political change in Russia. All right, Brian, you'll get the last word here. Yeah, no, I would I would agree with all of that with what was just a caveat that Russian econ the Russian economy is so dependent on hydrocarbons mm -hmm. and as we enter into a prolonged period of low energy prices, I can't see that not hurting the Russian economy. I um, mean, even the even the big oligarchs actually. Um, again, we don't. We have to have a lot of epistemological modesty as we kind of look forward into this because we're in such uncharted territory. But one thing I am noticing right now, and while the while the record among democratic states is decidedly mixed in how well they have handled this crisis, some have done outstandingly well. New Zealand. Germany, South Korea are the most notable examples, but there's others, Austria, the Czech Republic, there's a lot, I mean, the, 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 and then there's others, no need to mention names here, that have you know, done not so well. But what is among the authoritarian states like Russia, the record is almost across the board bad. I mean, Russia, Belarus, India, Modi's India, where the you know, populist regimes, Bolsonaro in Brazil, we're seeing the authoritarian regimes really, really struggling with this almost across the board. And I'll, I'll be glad to be proven wrong if somebody can think of a counterexample. I'll throw China out as a counterexample. I don't buy it. China handled it very poorly in the very beginning and then recovered. Um, so I, I, I don't include that. But I just I see democratic states showing their ability and flexibility, the best responses among democratic states showing their ability and flexibility. I think this is going to translate, I hope, maybe I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, into, into economic resilience as, as well. I mean, democracy's kind of been on its heels and on, you know, on the defensive for, for a little while now. My great hope is after this, uh, it will it'll have a resurgence. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, for your insights and, and your time. Thank our audience for sticking with us. Um, until next time, be safe and healthy. We're adjourned. I didn't know if we were supposed to stay on. Okay. <laughs>